Hey, everybody. I'm going to roll up the window to cut down on the wind noise. Although you can still hear the birds, right? This mic is mostly to pick up me, so you might not be getting the birds, but boy, they're going crazy. This is Arkansas winter. Freaking freezing, freezing, just hoth-like ninth circle of hell hell <laughs> and then it's 60 degrees <sighs> hmm. anyway i've been sitting in my comfy chair with my leg up on the footrest on a pillow usually with uh, ice on it or a cold pack anyway for a week now i'm in pajamas i'm actually sitting in my truck here in pajamas because um it's a pain in the butt to try to get jeans on over this hurt foot, and now I've got the boot. <laughs> so, I've been in pajamas for a week. This is the first week since I've moved back to Arkansas that I haven't been to Walmart. <laughs> and I don't see that many people, don't have much of a social life here. Um, when I go to Walmart, I typically don't talk to anybody except maybe a couple words with you know, a cashier, but still just being around people, going to the gym, being around people, that's enough. And I haven't been to the gym this week, haven't been to Walmart this week, I've just been in the comfy chair because my podcasting workstation is a stand-up workstation and I don't have to stand, I can sit at a tall stool, but still I'm upright and being upright this week has not been work, it has not been a workable plan because, you know, blood rushes to my foot, it swells up, it turns purple. I have to have my foot elevated. Same with my drawing workstation. I mean, it's it's not as bad as the podcasting workstation. I'm seated at the drawing station. But again, my foot is lower than the rest of my body. I just can't stay that way very long. So I've been sitting in a chair, <laughs> in a comfy chair with a remote control in my hand and an iPad and couple different phones. I mean, I'm surrounded by electronic gadgets and a big Roku TV. And I can sit here and watch YouTube all day or, you know, go elsewhere. I mean, there's a the whole war thing going. So I spend some time with Al Jazeera. It's driving me crazy. I, you know, just, the, just the couple times a week trips to Walmart and the daily trips to the gym, that's enough to satisfy whatever it is that is completely unsatisfied in my current situation. But uh, I'm down to one crutch and I can even take a few steps without any crutches, so which gives me hands with which to carry things and manipulate objects in my environment. Very helpful. Very helpful. But I'm reminded of a conversation that I had right at the very beginning of the pandemic with a guy whose name I don't need to mention, even though I can recall it. I'm not here to shame him. This is not a response to him. I don't think this is a public position that he staked a lot on, but we were just talking about UBI and we were talking about the possibility of the government cutting some checks, you know, relief checks to provide to people. I think they were called stimulus checks officially, but really they're relief checks because people are out of work or if they're business owners, their businesses are being crushed by the fact that people can't go out and live normal lives. This is at the very beginning of the pandemic. And I remember that he said, I mean, he offered this as an objection to either UBI or any sort of payment from the government to normal people, you know, not a, not newly created money that's given to banks or, you know, distributed to corporations or something, but just given to normal people. And his objection was a lot of those people who get those checks are just going to go out and buy expensive sneakers. And a variety of things come to mind. I don't remember what came to mind in the moment for that, other than so what, <laughs> you know, let them buy sneakers. Uh, but digging into the so what, we live in a consumer economy, which is based on the creation of new needs. I mean, once you've got a roof over your head, you've got adequate transportation, you're not cold, you know, you're not exposed to the elements because you have clothes, you've got enough to eat, you're, you're basically set. But that, that won't run this economy. This economy is dependent on the creation of new needs. Now, they're really, they're psychological needs. Ah, Bitcoin has arrived. So, you know, we, we are constantly 
assaulted by advertising, which really is designed to do one thing, and that's create insecurity. You lack something. There is something wrong with you, something missing from your life, some piece of tech, some piece of gear, some piece of clothing that you don't possess, and you are inadequate because of it. And hey, lucky you, we've got just the thing that's going to fill that gap, it's going to fill that need, it's going to palliate that hurt. Get your butt out of the... Go on, keep moving, keep walking. <laughs> So, you know, if, if a certain percentage of the population gets their stimulus checks and they go out and they buy expensive sneakers, good. That means the consumer economy is working. <laughs> you know, it's functioning. Because it needs consumers. It needs people with money to spend for the whole thing to work. If people don't have the money to spend, those expensive sneakers sit on the shelves until the rioting starts, you know, and then people break the windows and get in and, and run off with the sneakers. But... You know, for the most part, uh, if people don't have money, that stuff doesn't move, the economy freezes up, it doesn't work. So if a certain amount of people go out and buy expensive shoes, yay, hooray. But what it occurs to me, you know, beyond that is that who's going to go out and buy expensive shoes with this windfall of cash? Kids, young people. Now he's talking about sneakers, so I imagine he's thinking young black men. You know, they're going to go out and buy fashionable sneakers, whatever, whatever the young fashionable, you know, people wear on their feet these days. I have no idea. I'm so far from fashionable, but I think most people, they have to pay rent. They have to pay utility bills. They have credit card debt that they have to service. You know, maybe instead of rent, they have a mortgage, but it's still a monthly payment that you have to make. They have to buy food. They have to put gas in their cars. They have to make car payments. You know, they have to buy insurance for their cars. I mean, people have a lot of a lot of financial responsibilities, and a lot of people are behind on that. I think most people, when they get a you know a windfall, twelve hundred bucks, sixteen hundred bucks, whatever, they're just going to pay bills with it. They're just going to. I mean, they're going to take that and they're going to push it into the gigantic gaping maw that is the demands put upon them by this, you know, consumer economy, this industrial economy, this um, post-industrial economy, this shuffling papers around and uh, financializing everything economy. Most people, I mean, the people who fetishize expensive sneakers probably already have their expensive sneakers. Now, I mean, the thing with fetishizing expensive sneakers is you always need the new brand and they change a little bit every year, right? Like car models and, uh, you know, they need to be new. They can't be creased. They can't be dirty. So yeah, I mean, you, you always got to go out and buy new sneakers if that's your priority. But I think for most people, it's just not their priority. And that's just this overly vivid stereotype, you know, which is an argument against basically giving the people what they need in order for them to do their part to keep this whole consumer economy turning over. Now, if you want to argue against the consumer economy, hey, I, I'm not going to argue back. I'm just going to say it's, it's, what, it's the position that we're in now. It's the system that we're embedded in right now. And to shift to a different system, the shift either has to be slow and gradual so that it's not painful, or if it's sudden, it's going to be jarring. It's going to be uncomfortable. And, you know, maybe you think that you're psychologically positioned, geographically positioned, or, you know, prepper, prepped, you know, ready to weather the storm, but most people aren't. And in all honesty, you probably aren't either, if you really think about it, if you think it through, if you think of the implications of a collapse that most people are unready for, or maybe not a collapse, maybe a sudden transition, you know, a discontinuity that is going to be very upsetting and, you know, physically difficult for most people. You think you're set up to endure it, but are you set up to endure their failure to endure it? Are you set up, I mean, are you, maybe you think you're psychologically prepared to defend what's yours with deadly force as often as is necessary. And yeah, if you've killed 20 people, you know, killing the 21st is probably not going to be that hard, but killing the first one, it's going to be damned hard. And for a lot of people who think they're up for it, they'll discover that they aren't. So is there a larger point that I'm making other than 
you know, it's hard not to think in stories. It's hard not to think in very vivid examples of ideas. But at the same time, that gets us into trouble. So, you know, the overly vivid idea is um, young, shallow, materialistic people who have no good sense and who won't husband the money if you give it to them. I mean, this is, this is the perennial excuse not for helping poor people. You can't give poor people money because you, you can't give nice things to dogs. You know, you can't give fancy stuff to animals. You can't give money to poor people because they don't understand money. They don't know how to spend it responsibly. They don't know how to behave with it. So you can't help them. You just can't help them. You know, this is the Malthusian line. Uh, I, I got into it with somebody on Twitter a couple weeks ago. He was saying, uh, make Malthus great again. Um, you know, he, he's a Malthusian. He thinks that if you have a lot of people, that, you know, populations grow faster than food supplies. And I just, I can't believe that anybody, I mean, I used to buy into it. You know, you, you can only increase food supplies so much because there's only so much land. There's only so much increased production that you can leverage with like new fertilizers or new techniques or new seeds. Um, so, you know, there's only so much that you can grow the food supply, whereas, you know, people expand exponentially. One couple has four kids, you know, you're on this, this logarithmic uh, expansion. But if there's not food for the people to eat, they won't reproduce or they won't grow to reproductive age. I mean, you, you can't have a population that has outpaced its food supply because people are made of food. <laughs> you know, it just, it doesn't work that way. It never has worked that way. You know, what, what drives famine? Typically war or typically, you know, a government, like the biggest famine of our lifetimes. Well, most of us, <laughs> many of us weren't alive. I was alive, but many of us were not alive. During the, the massive famine uh, in China under Mao, where basically everybody along the chain uh, was afraid to report anything bad to their superiors. So while the harvests were fair to middling, everybody was reporting, oh, it's great, it's great. And every, you know, every layer of management up the chain to the top of the Communist Party exaggerated how great it was. We've got so much excess you know, wheat, rice, whatever. Uh, we, we're just doing great. So Mao sitting up there at the top getting all these great reports says, well, we've got 10 times as much food as we need. Well, sell most of it and let's buy expensive stuff. Let's buy, you know, earth moving equipment. Let's buy weapons. Um, and then it turns out, oh shit, we sold all the food to buy stuff that we didn't really need. And now people are starving to death and tens of millions of people starved to death. That was not a, that was not a result of people breeding too much. And if you go back and a lot of people know Malthus, and I certainly fell into this. In, in my peak oil days, I really got seduced by uh, Albert Bartlett. In fact, I've got an, an interview with Albert Bartlett in my book, talking about the exponential function and how most people don't understand exponential functions and, um, you know, basically just saying too many people, too many people, too many people. The more people there are, the less any one human life means. And he actually described himself as a modern day Malthusian. But then if you dig into Malthus, you know, so I accepted all that without actually reading Malthus. But then if you, you dig into Malthus, you discover, one, he didn't think people bred too much. He thought poor people bred too much. And he thought they bred too much because they were just addicted to sex. They didn't have the self-control of refined upper-class people to curtail their carnal urges. And every time they had the chance to do it, they did it and too many babies. But at the same time, Malthus also understood that a static population, one that wasn't growing, was a dead population. That for a dynamic economy and for a dynamic nation, you needed a growing population. So he was not at all in favor of curtailing birth rates. He absolutely did not want people to use contraception. He thought that was wicked that the only legitimate way to curtail birth was through self-discipline, through self-denial. And he said that poor people are never going to do it. And so the more you help poor people, the more you sustain them in their bestial, lustful, slothful ways, the worse you're going to make the world. So, you know, to save the world, 
you absolutely have to deny any aid to poor people. That was Malthus's agenda. That was his messaging. And it's, it's astounding that people pick it up and they just, you know, they just hear the exponential growth. People outgrow their food supplies, you know, they, they outgrow the resource base. It's, like, it's never, it's never too much sex. It's never too many babies that cause famine. It's almost always mismanagement from the top or war or, you know, crop failures. And crop failures, <laughs> that, that for most of the human experience on this planet, we've been hunter-gatherers. Crop failures were not a thing because we didn't have crops. You know, we, we did have a sort of horticultural side hustle. So we were encouraging the growth of certain plants, knowing that they would, you know, they could be gathered at certain times. But it wasn't agriculture. You know, it wasn't fixed, like, arable agriculture, which, yeah, that, a crop failure in that mode where you have a much larger population and you've got a specialization of labor, division of labor, where you've got most people still, you know, farming, but then on top of that, you can build a priestly class, you know, an administrative class, which is really what the priestly, priestly caste was or caste class was. And, you know, you get a military class and as you get more sophisticated and, you know, we've got more people who are able to get away from agriculture, then you get merchant mercantile classes and artists and you know it it flowers from there and that's great i mean for me i don't want to live a hunter-gatherer lifestyle even though i imagine certain aspects of it would be quite rewarding you know particularly the i i've never hunted in my life i've never shot an animal in my life i've killed chickens <laughs> i've killed fish but I imagine, uh, you know, taking down a deer or something bigger with you and your friends and just some spears. Damn, I'm sure that's a rush. I'm sure that's a thrill. I'm sure that's an exciting thing to relive and recount time and again around the campfire. Uh, but, you know, half of human suffering is toothache. Um, because of our fucked up incentives, I mean in this era where dentistry is quite sophisticated, still a lot of people are suffering unnecessary dental pain because it's unaffordable. But I certainly wouldn't want to live in a world simply without dentistry. Anyway, what's the message? Two messages. Buying expensive shoes with your your welfare check. Let's just put it right there. Your welfare check. Buying expensive shoes that you don't need with your welfare check in the context of a consumer society is you being a good citizen. Good on you. Good move. Thank you. Thank you for your participation. And secondly, Malthus is bullshit. Malthus is fucking bullshit. And his agenda was not... I mean, there was a place in his heart, where he saw that poor people, the lives of poor people sucked, and he felt bad about it, and he felt the need to wrestle with it, and write about it, and think about it, but ultimately, the conclusion that he reached was, you can't help poor people. Helping poor people just makes the world worse. That's where he was going. I mean, that's, that's the end point that he arrived at and thought, yeah, I'm going to write a book about that. And modern people hear it and they, it, it appeals to, I guess, this sort of Rousseauian noble savage mentality of really the best life is the most natural life and anything that is human artifice or anything that is the result of uh, large complex civilizations is unsustainable and untenable and ultimately wrong and just needs to be cleared away. Too many people breeds too much complexity, too much mischief. We should all be breaking our backs to get the very mere necessities of life, and we should die at 40. I mean, that's, that's not what people are thinking consciously. That's sort of what you arrive at if you think it through. If you think, you know, we shouldn't have fertilizer, we shouldn't have mechanical methods for raising crops. You know, we, we shouldn't have long distance transportation of goods and services and, and people, sub, you know, subsisting on food grown in other countries. We can't have that. 
Yeah, we can. <laughs> You'd miss it. You'd sure miss it if it was gone. I am not saying anything about Ukraine in this video. Anyway, blah, blah, blah. Talk to you later.